Well, I guess uh, we will tell everybody else to wait, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It's nice to see you guys here. Thank you. <laughs> you wouldn't believe we had a full class for our first one. I think we had close to 40 wow. uh, for our first class. So you guys get royal treatment because you get one-on-one -on -one interaction. <laughs> the rest of my can answer all the questions. Uh, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to learn, to learn about uh, the simple treatments that you've given us to keep us healthy. And Father, I just ask that you will give us wisdom as we seek to learn them so that we can share them with others in our own communities. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's see. This is your first time here, right? Yeah. And the others have all been here all week. Uh, but uh, just to give you a brief overview, uh, our first day, which was Monday, uh, we, we did kind of an introductory meeting, you might say. We shared the story of how God led us in our own community as we started in a brand new community, just learning how to break down the barriers of prejudice and uh, to earn the trust and confidence of our community so that we could lead them to Christ. And uh, how we did that was... Uh, through a simple cooking class uh, that we started two and a half years ago and is still going uh, once a month, uh, just one evening a month class on how to use fruits and vegetables. Uh, just a very simple class. And so then on Tuesday, uh, we shared how you can do that same kind of simple class. And all the notes are in that binder that you have. So you have all the handouts and you can go to the ABC and order the previous seminars. But uh, we did an actual cooking demonstration, and I gave recipes, which you have now, and uh, how you can just take, you know, two or three or four recipes and make a whole class out of it, and feature one fruit or one vegetable each month. Just a simple class, how to use fruits and vegetables, you know, not something saying, well, this is what's wrong with meat, and this is, you know, how you have to eat and whatever else, but no. Uh, this is how to use fruits and vegetables and add them to your diet. And uh, just as a way to, you know, break down those barriers and make friends. With the to, community. With the community, that's correct. And so uh, it's been a real blessing. But uh, then yesterday, we shared how you can write your own health talks. And uh, how, you know, if your class is featuring one fruit or one vegetable each month, uh, if... Uh, your health talk is also about that fruit or vegetable and what the benefits are of it and what parts of your body it helps and what diseases it helps fight. And you can weave in, you know, a little eight laws of health nugget into that as your talk uh, rather than saying, well, you know, this is what you got to do type of thing. And so it makes it easier, especially if you don't have letters behind your name, to be able to share something and it, it fits with the class and it's very non-threatening to the community. So today we're taking one step further now, and we're teaching how uh, to use simple natural remedies. Now, uh, this, the purpose of this class is twofold. The primary purpose of this class today is I want to teach you how to use natural remedies on yourself, okay? And on your family, whether it be you know, your spouse or your child. But how to use natural remedies yourself. And the reason is, and we covered that yesterday, uh, if you are not a doctor, you can't prescribe. But you can share, this is what I have done. <coughs> so if you go home and you try these natural remedies, and someone asks you a question, you can say, this is what I have done, and it worked for me. And so it just gives you that ability to be able to share. And so uh, that's actually what we're going to be going over today. Simple, simple natural remedies. Uh, most people nowadays, it didn't used to be years ago, but nowadays especially, when people hear the word natural remedies, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is just kind of like a, what are you trying to sell? You know, what multi-level marketing company are you a part of? Uh, what miracle cure product do you want me to start using? Uh, what, you know, am I going to have to be a rich man to afford this thing? Uh, but that's not the way God designed natural remedies. I'm not saying all those things are bad. It's just God gave us natural remedies. They're accessible to everybody. 
And those are the ones that we're going to be focusing on today. Using water, vegetables, and common herbs. So, uh, we're just going to go right into it. There's a lot of information here. I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But I'm going to do my best to at least give you an overview of all of it. And uh, if you have more questions, you can do your own research and, and uh, practice it at home. So I'm going to use Daniel as my patient. Uh, for the second time today, he's going to have another ailment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he does have one. <laughs> uh, the first one I want to share with you is on page one, and it's the hot foot bath. So a uh, hot foot bath is something that you can use uh, to relieve symptoms of headaches, uh, congestion, low-grade fever, pelvic congestion, uh, or pain anywhere. Uh, you can even use it to relieve the pain of a toothache. It's not going to cure your toothache by any means, but uh, it can help temporarily to pull the blood away from that area down to your feet, and that will give you temporary relief. Um, of course, you still need to go to the dentist if you have a toothache. <laughs> but sometimes if they can't get you in for a day or two, you got to have something to survive on until then. Uh, a caution, of course, uh, for a hot foot bath, you don't want to do it if you are an insulin-dependent diabetic or if your patient's an insulin-dependent diabetic or someone who has poor circulation in their feet because you're putting hot water on their feet and you don't want to cause problems, especially if they don't have a lot of feeling, can't tell hot or cold, or if they bruise easier, things like that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it's wonderful for nearly everyone, other than those group of people. What you need, first of all, besides your patient, is uh, you need a comfortable chair for them to sit in. Uh, something like this kind of a chair works fine. I've used a sofa, I've used an easy chair, I've used a rocking chair, a wooden chair, I mean, whatever you have, use it, okay? I even did a metal chair once. Uh, in fact, I think one time I didn't even have anything, and so our patient actually sat on the edge of the tub and we used the bathtub as the, <laughs> the basin for the hot water. But uh, let me just stand up for just a minute. First thing you want to put on your chair is a nice blanket, and I like to use a washable blanket because it's going to be soaked with sweat. Obviously not today. We're going to do a pretend one with uh, everything without water. But uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it would be quite a major mess to clean up in this room if I had to do all that laundry and everything else. <laughs> but anyway, I put a blanket on and then I put a sheet on. If you have a chair that you're really worried about getting ruined, you can put a waterproof pad underneath uh, or a piece of plastic. Um, to keep that water off of it. But uh, then uh, have your patient sit down. Now, obviously, Daniel's wearing clothes, but uh, if I was going to actually do this treatment for real, uh, I would have them put something comfortable, light, loose fitting, pajamas preferred, uh, because they're going to be sweating. That's the purpose of this treatment, is to make them sweat. And so you want something that's not going to be real tight and constrictive and stick to them really bad when they're sweating. So I like light, loose fitting cotton pajamas. So anyway, then you just wrap them up with the, the sheet. And then wrap them up with your blanket. And then... Uh, and cover them. With a nice big heavy blanket, Daniel's going to cook today. <laughs> Even if we don't give him water, he's still going to sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I got pretty hot earlier. <laughs> now this is his second treatment today. <laughs> so anyway, if I have clothespins, I'll secure the blanket with clothespins so it's not going to fall off. You want to make sure that it's snug around your neck, not choking them, but you don't want cold air going down your neck. Um, <laughs> you look like you're afraid of being choked. So uh, then uh, you want, um, first of all, a pot of boiling water. And uh, you want a lid on it to keep it nice and hot when you take it off that stove. And of course, that takes a few minutes to boil, so that's the first thing I do when I put the other treatment. And then I have a towel. 
and I usually fold it in half and put it on the floor so that way I can take my boiling water and if I spill any water or anything, the towel works as a hot pan and soak up any spilled water. And uh, then you need uh, a bowl of ice water. We're going to pretend this has ice water in it. And you'll need a washcloth for that. And so I put that on my towel next time. And then I make sure I have a clean, dry towel that I can use to dry off his feet after the treatment's over. And uh, the last thing, well, there's two more things you need. You'll need some kind of dipper. I like to use something like this. It's not going to melt in boiling water. But any type, metal soup spoon, whatever, any kind of dipper that you need. Uh, and then make sure they have some kind of water or herb tea or something, either lukewarm or warm, preferably warm, to drink. I have done these in so many different places. I've done them in Hope Order programs. I've done them in college dorms. I've done them in hotel rooms. I've <laughs> done them in all kinds of places. Use whatever you have available, you know. Uh, as long as you've got some towels and, I mean, I wrapped up the person in a sleeping bag because I didn't have any blankets, you know, just use what you've got. Uh, the basic idea is the same. So, uh, <clears throat> then the last thing that you need is some kind of basin for water. And uh, this is our pretend basin today, obviously it won't hold water. <laughs> <laughs> but this is about the size that you want. Uh, you don't want a little tiny bowl, you know, this size, because uh, what's going to happen is, you know, they can get their feet in it okay, but you can't keep adding water to keep that water warm. It's going to spill over the top. Uh, if you, uh, I've used everything from garbage cans to uh, uh, big uh, mixing bowls to mop buckets to bathtubs to, you know, you name it, I've used it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, use what you have on hand. If you use a trash can, wash it first. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> and don't try to use this because it won't be very well. <laughs> but uh, make sure whatever it is that it's got room that you can add more water to it. Uh, you start out by filling it with just regular warm water, uh, not super hot because usually, especially if someone's sick, their feet are going to be cold. And so you don't want, you know, them burning when that's the first part of the treatment. So, you know, just, just warm water and just enough to cover their ankles so you're not talking a huge amount of water. Uh, so, go ahead and stick your feet in there. And then what I do is I make sure my blanket covers over the top so the steam from that warm water is going to warm them up. Uh, anything you can do to <laughs> warm them up. <laughs> Daniel's cooking, even though he doesn't have hot water in there. <laughs> so anyway, once uh, the patient gets used to the water and their feet, you know, they're okay. They're not, you know, trying to yank their feet out of the water anymore. Uh, you take your dipper and you put in a half a cup of that boiling water. But you don't want to pour it directly on their feet. Uh, that would be a serious mistake. So you have them take their feet out. I usually tell them to balance it on the sides. Kind of hard to balance on the side of a box. But anyway, you dump it in and mix it up with your hands. Uh, that way you can know it's not too hot. Test it with your wrist, uh, not your fingers. Your wrist is your uh, measuring for water. And if it's way too hot for your wrist, then you know you better add a little bit of cold to it. But if it's, you know, hot but bearable in your wrist, then just don't put your feet back in. And they, they, usually, they usually scream and holler and tell you that you're cooking their feet and whatever else. But you want to raise the temperature as hot as they can stand. I mean, so they can just barely stand with their feet in there. Uh, you don't want it so hot that they keep their feet out because that would be a thing. But um, uh, every minute or two, check the temperature. You can check the temperature with a candy thermometer if you want to be exact. Or you can check the temperature with your wrist. But as soon as it starts to cool down a little bit and they say, oh, okay, I'm finally getting used to it. You say, oh, good, it's time to warm it back up again. And you add some more, another half cup of warm water. And uh, mix it up and then have them put the back in. And then they start their howling all over again. And you just continue that. Your object is to raise this temperature of this water up to between 115 to 120 degrees. So that's pretty high. 
And obviously that's going to take some time to do that. So, you know, you just buy a half cup or, you know, if half cup isn't enough to warm it up fast enough for them to put one cup in, but never more than one cup because boiling water is pretty hot. Uh, after a few minutes, they will start to get warm. And of course, you can give them sips of liquid uh, on and off through the whole treatment, uh, especially if it's warm liquid. You don't want to use ice water. Uh, as soon as they start to sweat, uh, that's, that's your goal. You want them to sweat. Uh, that's, as soon as they start to sweat or get warm, that's when you want to start putting the ice water on their forehead because you don't want them overheating. And uh, by then they're like, oh, it feels so good. <laughs> and uh, that's also when you start your time. Uh, and you want to continue this treatment anywhere from five minutes after they sweat to 20 minutes after they start sweating. Uh, the length of time varies on, number one, how much time you have, two, how well they're handling it, and three, their age, uh, or if they're sensitive to heat. If it's someone who's really sensitive to heat, you want to do a shorter. Uh, if it's someone who can you know, tolerate more heat, then you can do longer. And of course, if you've got a, a, someone who's a little bit older, you won't want to do it near as long. Uh, now, you, once in a while, you will come across someone who does not sweat. And uh, <laughs> if you wait till they sweat, you're going to have a long dream, and they're going to be really exhausted. And so instead, if, if they tell you, well, I'm, I don't sweat, you know, and you notice after, say, five or ten minutes that they're still not sweating, uh, the best way to do it is to check their oral temperature. And you can write this in your handout, so I didn't put that in there. Uh, as soon as their temperature reaches 100 degrees, that's their body temperature, uh, then that's when you start your time. Uh, usually about the time they reach 100 degrees, they're sweating, but some people don't. And so uh, if it's someone who sweats well, I usually don't even bother to use a thermometer. But if it's someone I'm worried about or I want to keep special tabs on, then I'll use the thermometer. And, uh, you can elevate your temperature past 100 degrees. That's just when you start the time. Uh, if it gets up to 102, 103, it's not a problem. Try not to make it past that. Goal. That's, that's pretty much your max. Um, but what you're doing is you're creating an artificial fever, which, or it's not artificial fever, you're just creating the fever. And uh, when your body has a fever like that, it elevates the white blood cell count. And so, of course, you know, when you've got more white blood cells, they destroy the bacteria and you know, the problems, uh, the germs and everything else in your body quicker because there's more of them. You, know, you just increased your army. And uh, not only that, but with the hot water down there and the cold water up here, you're pulling all that congestion and blood and everything else down to the feet, which will relieve a headache um, or sinus congestion or a cough or uh, anything like that. I have actually used this treatment to treat a low-grade fever because it actually elevates the fever higher than the low-grade fever was and it kills the, the problem quicker and the fever will break usually shortly after the treatment. And uh, So I've had really good success with that as well. Um, once you've started that time, you're now you've got a two-fold job, right? Because you're trying to keep the ice on their forehead and this gets hot really quick once they get to that temperature. <laughs> so you pretty much are, you know, get uh, more cold water for their forehead, stick it on, and then you're adding more hot water on their feet. And then back to the cold water in the forehead and hot water in the feet. You're pretty much rotating with that for the duration of your time. And uh, then when your time is up, no matter uh, when that is, uh, the first thing you want to do is get their feet out of the water. And uh, you will pour the rest of your ice water on their feet. <laughs> <laughs> you should hear how he howls and squeals. <laughs> but it really does feel good. Like they'll say, oh no, please don't do that, please don't. But then when you pour it on, it's like, oh, that feels good because your feet are so hot from that hot water. And uh, <laughs> you'll put them back in the water. <laughs> as soon as you pour that cold water on their feet, uh, you immediately grab your towel and you dry their feet off thoroughly. And you will need to dry more than just their feet off. You're going to need to dry their legs off because they're going to be sweating. And uh, 
then what I do is I tell them, you know, I know you're all sweaty and icky and whatever else, but I want you to just go change into some clean, dry pajamas, put on warm, warm socks, and go to bed for a half an hour. And after that half an hour is up, of course they've sweated more, uh, then they can go take a cool shower and, and change and whatever else they want to do. Uh, but you want them to keep that sweaty for another half an hour. And that will help to continue what you just did. The warm socks will keep that warmth on their feet, will continue to pull that congestion down, and uh, the sweating will continue to get rid of the toxins. You're getting rid of a lot of toxins out of your pores of the skin when you sweat. And that's why you want to try to make them sweat, if it's at all possible. So, any questions on that? It's really not that hard. Um, it is time consuming. A treatment you can pretty much guarantee from start to finish is going to take you between 45 minutes to an hour if you count prep time and clean up. Um, but it doesn't use too many towels. You know, you'll have to wash a blanket, wash a sheet, and a couple towels, and that's about it. Uh, now you can cool off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm done with you for a little bit. I'll need you again later. So any questions on that? Good. Well, then we'll move on to the next one. The next one is uh, hot and cold fomentations. <clears throat> have you ever heard of those? Yeah. You have? Have you? Have you done them? 